Welcome. Last time we talked about Kierkegaard's um, essay, The Truth is Subjectivity. Today we're going to do um, a little bit of a different thing. We're going to talk about one of his, um, one of his contributions to, um, to psychology, actually. Um, but in order to set that up, let's, let's do this for some preliminary stuff here. Okay? Um, philosophers before Kierkegaard speculated about the proposition, I exist. Remember Descartes. But it was Kierkegaard who observed that the crucial part of this they had missed, namely, that my own existence is not at all a matter for speculation, but it's a reality in which I am personally and passionately involved. I encounter my own existence. I live it. It's my life. Okay? In Kierkegaard's encounter with the self, he noticed and elaborated three levels of existence, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. And his writings on this is one of the most significant contributions to philosophy and to psychology. And we're going to, um, to now look at those. The first one, um, the aesthetic. The A personality is what he well, is what he, what he often calls this the A personality, and we're going to illustrate this with three quotations. Let me get to mine right here in this book. I do not care for anything. I do not care to ride. But the exercise is too violent. I do not care to walk. Walking is too strenuous. I do not care to lie down, for I should have to either remain lying, and I do not care to do that. Or, I should have to get up again, and I do not care to do that either. Summa summarum, I do not care at all. Now my, what might be my favorite one. Let others complain that the age is wicked. My complaint is that it is paltry. For it lacks passion. Men's thoughts are thin and flimsy like lace. They are themselves pitiable like the lace makers. The thoughts of their hearts are too paltry to be sinful. For a worm, it might be regarded as a sin to harbor such thought, but it is not for being made in the image of God. Their lusts are dull and sluggish, their passion sleepy. They do their duty, these shopkeeping souls, but they clip a corn on a trifle like the Jews. They think that even if the Lord keeps ever so careful a set of books, they still may cheat him a little, out upon them. This is the reason my soul always turns back to the Old Testament and to Shakespeare. I feel that those who speak are at least human beings. They hate, they love, they murder their enemies and curse their descendants throughout other generations. They sin. The third one. The essence of pleasure does not lie in the thing being enjoyed, but in the accompanying, of, but the accompanying consciousness. If I had a humble spirit in my service who, when I asked for a glass of water, brought me the world's costliest wines blended in a chalice. I would dismiss him in order to teach him that pleasure consists not in what I enjoy, but in having my own way. We might point to three types or three ways of being an esthete. First, there are the children. Children are ultimate aesthetes, moving from new experience to new experience with interest in any of them fading quickly. Remember the most common complaint you had during the summertime? I'm bored. I'm bored. This is boring. The aesthete's biggest fear is boredom. Okay? And, um, God, I hated that when I was a kid. I remember that pretty well. Second type of aesthete are adult aesthetes, those with no roots, wanderers, metaphorically or literally. 
Okay. Um, I am a child of the 70s, ultimately. And the 1970s, um, you guys, I'm sure, may or may not know of, remember disco music. I hated it at the time. Um, less so now, but still at the time it was, it was awful. But these discotheques had these this image of the disco king who, um, who um, you know, just was out just for the good time, out for the pleasure, out for the party, and always had his silk shirt unbuttoned down to about here with a spoon hanging on a chain right there for the cocaine that they were passing around. That's the adult asleep. That's one example. Okay. Um, the um, the aesthete, though, is driven into a panicky flight from the prospect of boredom. And this flight, which Kierkegaard says, in fact, is a flight from himself, becomes a form of desperation and despair. The person who's always flying from, from, from this to that, this to that, this to that, this to that, never stops and considers themselves and what they are. They run from themselves constantly. Okay? The third type are the intellectual aesthetes. The Greek root for theater and theory is the same Greek root is the same Greek root. Okay? A theater is a place where we are spectators, detached from what is going on. Remember Descartes' perspective, right? Interesting and boring are the dominant categories um, are the dominant categories of description. Okay? The intellectual aesthete will try on ideas, let's try this on, without ever really believing any of them. The second stage, the ethical. No, these are not like floors on a building. One doesn't totally necessarily leave one behind the previous one becomes central, although the break from the aesthete could be eventually be total. We'll see. At some point, the aesthete chooses to be such, and this choice is her doom. To choose is to become is to choose to become something, and that contradicts the A's way of life. Okay. Um, this quotation is a very helpful one from William Barrett's book um, on existentialism. This, this, this is a very cool book, Irrational Man. The fact is that the aesthete, at the very moment of choosing the aesthetic way of life, contradicts himself and enters into the ethical. See, once you choose as an aesthete, that's your doom, because then you stop. He chooses himself and his life resolutely and consciously in the face of the death that will come as certain. And his choice, by its very consciousness and resoluteness, is a piece of finite pathos in the face of the vast nothingness stretching before and after his life. The aesthete may not wish to dwell on the somber background, and his choice, but the background is surely there even if we do, were to use Tolstoy, were to use Tolstoy, it, okay, let me back up. The aesthete may not wish to dwell on the somber background to his choice, but that choice is surely there even if we do, to use Tolstoy's phrase, are not able to stand face to face with it. It is thus by an act of courage that we begin to exist ethically. We bind ourselves to ourselves for a lifetime. This is what pushes the A into the E stage, okay? The ethical is the one who lives and dies by the rules. The reaction against the aesthetic way of life is complete. This might be called the death of the passion for the individual. Everything is done for it's because it's the right thing to do. Follow the rules and we'll all get along. Everyone gets a fair shake. For example, consider a shopkeeper. Let's say the person is a butcher. Okay, back when there were such things. Um, everyone gets the same treatment. Everyone gets the same deal. Um, both the rich woman and the poor man. They come in. 
they want a pound of meat. That pound of meat costs this much money. That's what you get. That's what you get. That's what you get. You have to be fair to everyone. That's what's fair, following the rules. Okay? Eventually, though, the ethical will be called upon to break from it. And this break results the move into the religious stage. Now, Sometimes Kierkegaard speaks of the ethico-religious stage as if they may be one. Um, they're connected, but what the point here is that the ethical alone isn't sufficient. Okay. You see, okay, remember, the E lives by universal rules, and sometimes we are called upon to go beyond the ethical. The E lives by universal rules, yet universal rules cannot always or completely capture me, the individual. Because of this, the sometimes the religious, or the ethical at the time, is called upon to go beyond what society might normally consider to be right, or to break a universal norm. And again, I have a quotation from Barrett, and I like this one also. Kierkegaard does not deny the validity of the ethical. The individual who's called upon to break with the ethical must first have subordinated himself to the ethical universal. So you have to have embraced that wholeheartedly. And the break, when he's called upon to make it, is made in fear and trembling and not in the callous arrogance of power. Breaking with the ethical is a trembling, it's a trembling-inducing thing, okay? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a horror of sorts. The validity of this break with the ethical is guaranteed, if it ever is, by one principle, which is central to Kierkegaard's existential philosophy as well as to his Christian faith. The principle, namely, that the individual is higher than the universal. This means also that the individual is always of higher value than the collective. Check that out. This universal rule of ethics, precisely because it is universal, cannot comprehend totally me, the individual, in my concreteness. When then is an abstract rule, it commands something that goes against my deepest self. But it has to be my deepest self when here in the fear and trembling of the choice reside. Then I feel compelled out of conscience, a religious conscience superior to the ethical, to transcend that rule. I am compelled to make an exception because I myself am exception. That is the concrete being whose existence can never, never, completely, never be completely subsumed under any universal system or even system of universals. Let me remind you, let me, let, as far as this, this universal and individual goes, remember when we talked about before, um, we when we did the introduction in the introductory lecture to existentialism, in that theme called the individual and systems, that uh, the individual cannot be understood within a rational system. Well, this is kind of what he's getting at here, right? We are individuals. These rules, as, as as we are each rag, radically individuals, and any universal system cannot capture that individuality. So the individual ultimately is higher than the universal. Okay? So there you go. The individual is higher than the universal. Um, sometimes Kigar also distinguishes two levels of the, of, of the religious, the A and the B. Um, the religious A would be someone who, for example, um, religious A is what we normally think about as being religious. Um, it's the practice of religion and so forth. But let's go back to the example of the shopkeeper, for example. Um, someone of this kind, um, of, of this variety, might very well, for example, when... The, the, the wealthy lady comes in, the example, the, the, the rich, rich woman comes in. He gives her, indeed, her fair price, her fair deal. However, 
when the poor person comes in, maybe he sees this person coming in and he backs the scale up a little bit. So maybe they get a little more. He's breaking a rule, but yet he's doing it for a higher purpose. But that's not really the religious that, that, we're, that we're getting at here. That, I mean, that, sure, that's, that's a, that's a te teleological suspension of the ethical. We'll come to that in a few minutes. But, um, but nonetheless, it still is breaking the rules for a higher good. But not a big deal, right? Um, however, what about the example of Abraham, the father who's been promised all these great nations, commanded in Genesis 22 to sacrifice his son Isaac? Okay. Um, Abraham doesn't question this. Instead, he just does it. And um, apparently, maybe, willing to do so even, um, I had a student once suggest to me that, that Abraham called Yahweh's bluff. Yahweh was commanding him to do something that was morally impossible, just to show him the limits. And Abraham said, I'll show you, I'll do it, and heads out to do exactly that. Um, Kierkegaard struggles mightily over this story. He wrote a series of little blurbs try, trying to work through and figure this out. I mean, what, how, how could he know that Abraham was actually being commanded by God and not some demoniacal force? Um, presumably, if he knew, but even if he knew, God commanded him to do something that was horribly immoral, yet he said, okay, I'll do it. That is the teleological suspension of the ethical. Or Kierkegaard and Regina. Um, this is, this is a, a famous romance of sorts, not, really very, not very romantic, but Kierkegaard nonetheless, he, um, he pursued this woman named Regina for two years before, he, um, before she finally, um, before actually he, he, he pursued her and she finally agreed to marry him after he you know, took him a while to propose. Um, but, you know, ultimately, she began getting in the way of his writing life. And you realize that he couldn't both be a husband and an author and doing his important work. Plus, he also came to believe that this was against God, too, to marry her. Um, so he regretted his decision. But he had to, for some kind of higher good, break her heart, and she was devastated, of course, right? But this whole idea of the transcendence of the universal, the teleological suspension of the ethical, um, you know, sometimes you got to bust the rules. There was this great TV show on back in the 1990s, back in the 90s, called um, um, Northern Exposure. Um, in Northern Exposure, there was this character, um, Chris. He was the morning DJ. Chris in the morning, they called him. And there was this, this was a, the show was set in a sleepy little town in Alaska. And um, stereo, car stereos began to get disappeared, began to disappear. It sold out of cars. This, this, this town didn't have crime. Well, it turns out that Chris was also the local minister who did marriages and divorces and all that because there was no one else around to do it. And he'd answered an ad in the back of Rolling Stone magazine. Turns out he was doing it just to stir things up a little bit, right? And this wonderful quotation, sometimes you got to do something bad just to know you're alive. I think Kierkegaard might approve. your assignment. Um, this actually is more of a reflective question than perhaps a critical one. And um, this question, which of Kierkegaard's three stages do you find most appealing and why? Um, if any of them, maybe. maybe or no, just most appealing. Okay? Doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be the one that ultimately, that you like ultimately, but just one's most appealing to you. Which one comes closest to describing you? Offer an example or two. Have fun with that one, okay? 
next time we do SART.